just doing some more trials with the spectrometer, but now on a real rock. Um, they're having a bit of issue with temperature, but we'll see if we can get some data out of this. Okay, so uh, this is going to be it for us today, and, and here's why. Right, so uh, if you were with us in the first dive, um, we uh, explained that uh, after a little bit of time in the bottom, uh, our system, uh, the camera in particular, uh, cooled down a little bit too much. When the camera cools down, uh, one of the components uh, uh, stops working. Uh, it has an electronic uh, system to prevent it from working at too cold temperature. So when it goes below, below I think it's 10 degrees Celsius, uh, it just shuts off. So this is just what happened uh, the other day. And uh, to mitigate that problem, uh, today we turned all the heaters on at the deck of the boat, and uh, we were going to keep them on all the time, all the way down to maintain temperature uh, inside the bottle. But uh, if you were here with us early on today, uh, you saw that uh, we had the ground fault that uh, had us recover the vehicles and, and the system uh, to go to deck, check it up, and then go down again. On the second dive, uh, which is this dive early on, uh, we also had uh, another ground fault, and for safety, uh, we decided to turn off the instrument. That means the heaters were off again. So uh, by the time we were down in the bottom, uh, temperature was already too cold, um, uh, and even operating the instrument, heaters back on, uh, it was cold. You know, it was too cold to to really uh, to really uh, operate here. So. We've done all we could in this dive, uh, given all the uh, ground faults and all the and all the issues. Okay. However, um, what we've learned is that um, our calibration that we did in the lab uh, it was pretty good. Uh, we have fine-tuned it here. Uh, we have found the optimal parameters um, to measure uh, a distance. We have measured farther away than we thought we could measure, and this really gives us uh, uh, you know very good feelings and uh, very strong conviction that next time. Uh, when we will not have any ground fault and we, we can keep all the heaters on from the deck all the way down, uh, we will arrive to the to the to the next dive to the bottom uh, uh, at a perfect, healthy, and warm and cozy condition, so we can really perform our science uh, as expected. But I think uh, at this point, uh, our qualification campaign for the instrument is complete, and I am happy to to declare uh, the system commissioned for scientific operations during. Nautilus Cruise 23 uh, NA149. So, thanks everybody for the help. Thanks autopilot, uh, human pilots, and uh, and all the navigators and and documentarians. And yeah, we'll stay around for a little bit. Uh, Daniel, yeah. if you want to to talk about the spectrometer, spectrometer a little bit as we turn off things, and and then we'll hand it over to scientists to to do sample and exploration. So yeah, that's great news, yeah. Pablo. Yeah, congratulations. Um, yeah, guys. great news. Thank you. Awesome. Seriously, uh, congratulations. I know it's been a uh, quite the journey to get here. So. <laughs> Excellent. So yeah, if you guys are standing by, we can, uh, you know, opportunistically measure things as we as we explore. Um, Do we retrieve the bucket lid? Yes. Uh, before we forget. Yes. Yep. Um, okay. And you want you, you want the instrument left on for the time? I can see the laser on now. Or do you want it off? I was just. I was doing one more thing, and then uh, let me turn off the laser internally. And uh, if you turn us off right now, you'll lose cam, the downward facing cam. If you'd like to keep that on for any reason, you can leave us on. If not, you can turn I us can off. I can turn, like I can leave the ethernet bottle on. I can turn the, the, the ramen off. If you turn the ramen off, you'll lose the downward facing camera. It's through our system. It's where yeah, it's I'm getting not sure power. Oh, that. your, your yeah, camera. We don't. Oh no, I don't. I don't. Uh, yeah. I just switched out of that. So oh, we're good. Yeah. Then you can shut us down. Oh, you want it on? Okay. Well. Oh. Well, yeah. The, the, you know the drill. So if you want the camera, keep us on. If you don't, I will take us off. There is a fish <laughs> so in Dan, the you camera. know he, he means the the ramen camera, the sub C camera, right? Yes. The downward uh, facing camera. It's it's sort of interesting to have for science, but we, we should be closer to the yeah, ground. Yeah, we don't, so we don't, don't particularly need it. Right. I don't think we really need it. Yeah, I I would say let's uh, conserve and uh, shut it shut it down. Okay. I got Dan in my ear. Wants it on. Do you want it off? Oh, which Dan? Uh, the what? Dan. Dan Cormany. Okay. 
It's nice to have on, guys, because um, we can see that we're not uh, contacting the rocks with the with the dive bot. Oh, there you go. Good idea. Thank you, Dan. Yep, just to say, you know, stay safe. Uh, yeah. Sure. Um, if you're leaving it on, do you want me to record? Ask the data manager. <laughs> uh, is it time stamped? Currently from 1970. I didn't get the NTP server uh. fixed. <laughs> so I would say no. Don't bother okay. recording. So, it, Daniel, uh, maybe while while Mike uh, completes the recovery of the call target, uh, it will be a good time now to to summarize what Raman uh, can do and, and not. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we can. Yeah. yeah so uh, the the main technique that we use here uh, to to measure sub C uh, is called Raman spectroscopy. Not ramen, uh, not to be confused with the food. Uh, mm -hmm. It's ramen, named after an Indian scientist who, in 1928, discovered that uh, when when light uh, hits uh, matter, uh, that could be gas, uh, liquid, solid. Uh, when 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 light hits matter, uh, some of the photons uh, that interact with this uh, with this target will lose energy uh, to the sample uh, and bounce back. Uh, with a little bit less energy. Uh, if you think about a tennis ball and you drop it on the ground, every time it's bouncing up, it's going to bounce a little lower, 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 eventually coming to to standpoint. It's because in every in every bounce, it is it is losing a little bit of energy, and this is what's called inelastic scattering. Uh, elastic means that the same energy comes in, comes out. Inelastic means that it's losing a little bit of uh, of, light, of, uh, of energy. So, uh, Sir Raman uh, in 28 discovered that uh, light has the same properties as a tennis ball, so to speak, and uh, suffers inelastic scattering when it interacts with matter. Uh, and for that, he won the Nobel Prize uh, in physics. Uh, and after that, a whole new uh, era for analytical chemistry was uh, started that only got better uh, as laser was invented. Because with laser now you can uh, focus a lot of photons, a lot of light in a, in a little bit of matter, in a few molecules even. And, and this is very important because uh, unlike other phenomena of light matter interaction like uh, fluorescence or scattering, the Raman effect uh, is very, very uh, faint. Uh, it's not very effective. In fact, only one photon out of 10 to the 13, uh, which I got lost in how many... Uh, uh, orders of magnitude that is, uh, but uh, you think about it is only one in, in, in a ton of them uh, It's gonna suffer this inelastic scattering. It's gonna lose this energy to the sample So uh, so the key is you know brute force approach, right? So you shoot a lot of photons uh, into the sample. So that's what laser does for you allows us to really uh, shine a lot of light into a tiny spot so that you really have a better chance to detect those few Raman photons that come back to you, uh, uh, you know, with less energy. And uh, once you're able to detect these photons, uh, if you can measure their wavelength, their energy, their color, relative to the color of your laser, then you know exactly what molecule is in your target. Uh, this is a way to fingerprint molecules in, in, a, in a target because uh, this uh, difference in energy, think about it again, that difference in altitude or in height of the tennis ball as it's bouncing uh, back to you, it is indicative and is diagnostic of the molecule that you have uh, in your in your target. So that's the trick with Raman. All you have to do is to measure the color of your photons in your laser and then measure the color of the photons coming back to you uh, after they, they touch the, the target and then voila, you know exactly uh, what you have uh, there in front of your eyes. There's more. Uh, if you look at how many of those photons come back to you, you can even uh, quantify uh, how much of this particular molecule you have in your in your uh, in your target. So that's why Raman, uh, starting in the 60s, 70s, as lasers were becoming more powerful and more mainstream and affordable, 
became uh, uh, you know a very very almost uh, a must-have analytical technique in the lab because it allows you without having to destroy the sample as you can see here remotely even at distance probe into the matter uh, analyze what the what rocks are made of what water is made of even what gases are made of so uh, such was the power of the Roman technique that uh, oh, uh, in 20, uh, what, well, essentially five, no, eight years ago maybe now, uh, NASA uh, decided to uh, to select two instruments uh, to build two Roman spectrometers to fly to Mars. So right now on, on the mission uh, Perseverance, the rover Perseverance, the one that has a helicopter flying around, uh, uh, we have two Roman spectrometers. Um, again because of the ability of this technique to really be so diagnostic so uh, we've come a long way uh, now from 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 the lab uh, to using lasers to go into mars and today in this expedition uh, is one of the very first times that uh, raman is used uh, underwater in fact uh, to our knowledge uh, it is the very first time that raman uh, spectroscopy is used as a remote sensor underwater so that uh, we can now explore, analyze uh, the seafloor uh, without having to stop the vehicle, without having even to sample. Uh, we can just mow the lawn, we can just fly over targets and uh, understand their chemistry, mineralogy, and even biology. So if you stay tuned with us uh, in future dives, we will uh, find corals, uh, we will find biomass and pigments that we will be able to see with our technology. So. I think uh, now that we have the instrument up and running, uh, everything's uh, working great. Uh, once we have these ground faults solved for good, we can keep the instrument warm enough and cozy. And then we can just start uh, doing exploration with Raman for the first time. So this is really, really exciting times. Thanks for that explanation. Yeah, thanks, Papa. Great work. Congrats again. Yeah, we just had a cutthroat deal um, try and get into our ROV system <laughs> while Mike is working our um, bucket plate target back on. Struggling. Struggle bus. <laughs> oh my god. And seatbelt on. Terrible, terrible. <laughs> She's good. Success. Yeah, they click it or take it. <laughs> it's really cute with the smiley face. Out of practice. <laughs> okay. All right, are we ready? Ready. Do we want to get the ship moving, or do we want to take a minute and look around this area? Um, I mean, we had a good bit, good amount of time. This area, Dwight. I don't know if you yeah. can look at. Um, I think we should just line up to do a traverse over to the next waypoint, yeah. and um, it'll take a little while for the ship to start pulling Atlanta, so we can use that time to look around yeah. a little more. All right. And what heading will we be moving at? Uh, we'll be moving at 260. Roger. Yeah, and I'm just going to note really quick, um, these crinoid stocks that we're seeing, a lot of them are, are headless in a way. <laughs> um, looks like there's some predation happening that we're not quite aware of, but um, there's a bunch of stocks without the actual sea star on it, the actual crinoid. Yeah. Bridge now. Can we start moving uh, 50 meters at 260 degrees and 0.2 knots? Yes, please. Someone's got a mic scraping across the desk back there. Yeah, we've just been seeing some stocked crinoids, some shrimp, a lot of fish. Saw a shark earlier. What's that floating in the back there? Is, uh, that, is that a shrimp? Yeah, that's the a shrimp. Thing, definitely a shrimp. Nice. 
Um, we have some sort of eel. We in zoom middle. in a little. Oh yeah, zoom in on the shrimp. That'd be pretty. Yeah. Look at those appendages go. Um, that darker abdomen looks really characteristic, but I'm not. Actually, I, I might have my shrimp. Oh, there it goes. I might have my shrimp anatomy wrong. But that darker center looks kind of characteristic, but I'm not entirely sure what um, it could be. Ooh, we have some crinoids here. Really pretty yellow color. Um, and a coral, perhaps? Yeah, there is a coral in the background, too. And even behind that, something round. Yeah, ooh, that looks like a... Can we zoom in on that? Yeah, yeah go please, ahead. if you're able. What exactly are you after? So, um, in the back, behind the coral, I want to look at that thing first. Oh, wow. Ooh, we have an ooh, urchin. Look. That's awesome. And ooh, we, look at the brittle like, star. Yeah, yeah. yeah. looks like we have yeah. a... Um, There's a lot going on here. Yep. So, that urchin... I'll work on an ID. That coral. Um, yeah, let me make sure I get it right. But I'm pretty sure. Yeah, we have a good zoom. Thank you. Um. Wow. So, fun fact is that we see right in this image a sea urchin, a rural star, and a crinoid, and yet. They all look so different, but they're all related. They're all yeah. echinoderms. Mm -hmm. um, so I really want to get an ID for that urchin first. You want to go back in on it? Um, no, we're we're good to go. You can keep moving around. Okay. I'm just going to do it in the background. Okay, pull wide there for you, Mike. So you didn't know anything more about sea urchins, like just in general, Sarah? Um, yeah. <laughs> I do. Um, they're so, of course, they're echinoderms. They usually have radial symmetry, which means um, they're symmetric from like the center. Um, I know the shallow water urchins. There's, I don't know if it's one species or multiple. Oh, we have so much going on right now. Um, you can actually eat their reproductive organ. It's called Ooh, uni. It's a Japanese um, specialty. But um, what is this? I was like, can we zoom in uh, on that fish? Vertebrate. Or eel? Oh, well, it looks like another um, cutthroat eel. Oh, yeah. But looks like a different type. Maybe like a partial zoom? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh, so much to look at. Yeah. Wow. Wow, this fella's just drifting along. Yeah. Um. Looks like some sort of synaphobranchid. Um, Does it look like it's about to? Yeah. Hmm, looks like it was about to eat something for a second. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot going on here. Yeah, this is pretty exciting. This is the most exciting it's been in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is the most I've seen on a dive. <laughs> So far, lots yeah. of diversity of um, different types of organisms for sure. Um, looks like uh, is that a not unstocked crinoid on the in the lower cent center? The lower, yeah, I can barely hear you. Sarah. Oh, really? I don't know if that's sound. That's this me. This a little better. Or, yeah, that's better. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, looks like another crinoid. Trying to get you a zoom, but I got some rocks no, under me here. No, it's all good. If um, you can't zoom oh. in from here, it's probably best I can I do. Say, there's also a coral ring next to us. If you can't. Ooh, yeah. Is that a sea star? Um, that is, yeah. It looks like, um, yes. Oh gosh. Sorry, I'm, I'm currently like organism overload right now, but yeah. Um, looks like a feather star for sure. Not sure what type, but definitely a feather star. Thanks for the zoom. Um, and then I think behind it, if you're able to get there, there's a coral to the right. You can kind of see it. Coral to the right. Lower right corner. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, I forgot. Oh, we have, uh, Let me just we go. back up. There's a lot of rocks around here. Yeah. 
Take your time. Let's see what's going on. Try and get in there. Oh! <laughs> Look at those sea lilies. Just fluttering the breeze. Yeah. Okay, go ahead and zoom in. Yeah, go for it. Oh, looks <laughs> like we have. <laughs> Thank you. Whoa, oh, another rat tail. Oh, wow. Another rat tail coming in. Okay. Um, here. That looks like the a subsea camera is awfully distracting. <laughs> it just doesn't. Uh, wow, what's it doing? It's. <laughs> um, looks like we have. Um, some reason I'm having a moment, but it okay, looks like red. you want the yellowish corals. Yeah, bamboo coral for sure. Um, some sort of skeleton. I can't tell if that's alive or dead. Right? There's some associates on it. Um, some I see a um, basket or brittle star on it. It looks like I don't know what that pink blobby thing on it is. Definitely some associate. Um, and then the coral on top of it is probably another bamboo coral. It looks like there's another associate on that coral. Yeah, like a shrimp yeah. or something. It, that could even, I, I the, mean, the, lob lobster the, the thing pink maybe? blobby things could be some sort of predator, maybe even, I don't know, like a sponge. I think we could get a zoom uh, in on that for that. I'm, I'm I think we're, yeah. Right Looks like there's a shrimp on the other coral. Yep. Oh, I see. So the yellow one is a paramaresid, and then two primnoids. Yep, there we go. And then there's a shrimp, and I really want to know what those pink blobby things are. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, oh, now that we're getting a little closer, awesome. you can see it's great shot. got some <laughs> Man. bilia type thing. <laughs> and the cusk. Oh, he I mean the a rat photo bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Whole party right here. Um, yeah, so we're getting that these pink blobby things are likely anemones oh. that are, oh yeah, I see the tentacles now, yep, definitely anemones that are colonizing the, um, paramaresid. Um, the white, the white primnoid could be Norella, but we're not entirely sure. But yeah, great Zoom. Thank you guys so much. Okay. So when you say associate, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so an associate is anything that lives on or kind of, um, well, it could be neutral or benefits from another sort of, um, another species, basically. Anything that's associated with another species. So like, for example, um, those oceanic white tip sharks that we saw earlier, there's some fish that like to swim with them called pilot fish. And those happen to be a mutualist species um, where the pilot fish benefit by swimming with the shark um, because there's a lack of predation obviously around sharks. And the sharks benefit by the pilot fish eating parasites off of them. So it's a symbiotic relationship. Yeah, mutualism, fun. Yep, we see it all over nature, and we see it all over the deep sea. Yeah, it's really cool to see these um, types of relationships at every depth and every type of environment. Yep, goes Go to ahead. show that life uh, finds a way. Unlikely friendships, right? Yeah. <laughs> yep, another coral over there. Um, looks like another. Do you want to go see maybe. it? I'm sure. Just a quick zoom. Okay, go ahead, video. Yep. Another primnoid with a brittle star. Um, oh, and something to the right of it. Um, looks like another uh, primary. Sorry, just getting close to the. Oh, it's bottom all good. 
That was a good enough zoom, I think. Anyways, thank you. Yeah, seeing a lot so far, which makes sense because we're kind of in the upper um, upper levels of this of the water column, and we're also on a seamount, which is super advantageous for um, organisms to colonize for a multitude of reasons. But um, one of the main reasons is that oh, and there's another coral to the leftish kind of maybe get a zoom on that. Sure, go ahead, video. Looks like another primnoid which are really cool. Ooh, yeah, this looks like a Norella, for sure, with another associate on it. Really, pink, really pretty pink color. And also, I think actually we're at this spot. But yeah, really pretty, thank you. Wow, we also see some cronoids, uh, just the stalks, but without the feathers. Uh, is it possible for them to actually regrow their feathers if it's just a stalk? Um, so, um, I want to say if it's just a stock, no. Um, the crinoid itself is, so yeah, we see that stock in the background. The crinoid, the organism itself is at the top. It's what that like flower looking, the lily part of it is. Um, the stock is actually um, kind of, I forget what it's made out of, but it's, it's not really, I think it has, um, it's part of its water vascular system and its nervous system, but it's not the organism. Like, it's not part that can regrow, I think. Like, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. I oh, know they can regrow. Ah. Um, you guys want to pick a rock anyways. to collect before our watch ends? Yeah, let's see if there's anything yeah. loose. Look for something angular. Cantaloupe size. <laughs> Be good to get one from this waypoint area and just to characterize the crest of this uh, mound we're on. Sarah or Lupi, if you want to pick it, I, you have a better um, view of the screen yeah. than I do. Sorry about that. Let's see. Uh, so Sarah, go for it. Are we looking for a certain, I guess we are looking for a certain uh, size? I think they're pretty much all the same. It would be better to find one that Angular. is close to a larger rock that, that may okay. have fallen off, like okay. an outcrop or something. And it would be best to look for one that's angular and sort of fresh looking yeah. rather than um, and somewhere and the ROV crusted. Can maybe somewhere... Maybe somewhere around here. Not sure if you can get in there. Mm. One right in the middle of the screen. That's pretty large, isn't it? Yeah. Can you use the telestrator? Um, oh, sorry. Um, are we thinking here? Yeah, that's what I... Just if I can get in there. Yeah. Safely. If not, there's definitely other spots. They're all looking kind of round. Yeah, I don't see the um, angular variety. So they're all about, yeah. okay. Now we can keep looking around. It doesn't have to be from this area. Okay. It depends what, how, how are we with the ship move right now? Um, we are still tracking towards we point two. Yeah, okay. I've actually got to catch up. Yeah. So, so let me get yeah. out in front there Make and see what I see. Yeah. It would be ideal to find some on the uh, where I can with some soft sediment for the back of the ROV to sit on. Sure. Yeah. To you like things in parallel <laughs> just as we're leaving. But yeah, seeing a lot, which is great. Great signs of biodiversity, even though we're one day late on International Biodiversity Day. 
Um, looks like there's some sort of glass sponge towards the lower left. So oh, that's a great sign. It. No, it's all good. Keep moving. Um, great signs. So when we're looking for rocks, why are we looking for ones that are angular and cantaloupe size in particular? Um, do you want to talk on that, Dwight? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the, the size is nice because it can give you, when you cut it open with the rock saw, it gives you enough um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, volume to kind of see what the sort of mineralogy of the rock is and other details of the texture of the rock. Uh, whereas if it's too small, when you, if it has any like ferromanganese crust on it, you, you just won't really see um, the, the core of the rock that well. And so we want to uh, also may potentially do geochronology on it. So you want to um, cut a s cut, be able to cut slabs that are good fresh pieces for for doing those sorts of studies. Mm -hmm. So that that's kind of justifies the size. Uh, the angular uh, ones we think are um, not as encrusted. Uh, you, you know that that don't have the uh, ferromanganese crusts as much. So it's a fresher rock. Um, which is opposite from um, the people that do want to study ferromanganese crusts. So uh, collecting one that has a crust on it isn't a bad thing necessarily. But um, if you want to do the geochronology and basic kind of volcanic history studies uh, in looking at the basalt, then angular rocks are um, uh, a, a better sample to collect. Um, just. Sorry to interrupt. Wait, number you're one. Good. I think I'm you're done. a little. I think you're a little quiet. Maybe bring your mic a little closer. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Perfect. Beautiful. Um, Thank you. and then I think maybe can we start looking for a rock here, perhaps? This is a better spot. Yeah. Okay. Are we still a bit behind? Do we still want to catch up? No, oh. we're okay. Oh, that's just another eel. <laughs> another cut. Oh eel. wow, what's this? Oh. We have a euplectelid, maybe. Oh wow! Which is a glass sponge. Almost looks um, big enough to scrub my back with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if we could get a zoom on that, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Let's get in a tiny bit more. Okay, go ahead, video. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So. This one, actually. Um, I should just come wide for a second again. I get in there better than that somehow, some way here. Definitely looks like a euplectelid from what I can see. A stocked euplectelid. Has this really interesting um, kind of like two parts to it. Um, okay, go ahead. It's like an inner and outer part. Yep. And we're looking, it looks like this is actually a Ceracopolis sponge, so a glass sponge. And yeah, these are really cool. What Great. are these sponges made of? So um, I'm not particularly sure. All sponges are definitely made of spicules, which are um, uh, sometimes calcium carbonate sometimes silica. Um, it all depends on the type of sponge, but that one's really neat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, there was a little shrimp that came by and dropped on the floor. Yeah. Yeah, we're seeing a whole bunch of different organisms here, which is really awesome. Yeah, this is a lucky find. Really a luck of the draw on this expedition. Yeah. Um, I guess maybe let's continue looking for rocks. Looks like a little bit of a different terrain here. Maybe a little bit more rocky. Maybe we have some loose. I'm also seeing 
bouts of what looks like crinoid stalks that are eaten. Oh, oh we have some stars. stars in the background. Looks like some sort of um, brittle star and another sea star. Oh, and they're just sitting yeah, right next to each other like pals. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow, beautiful. Okay, go ahead and zoom. Wow. Oh yeah, that's great. Okay, so we have multiple things going on here. Um, it looks like we have a coral skeleton, a sea urchin on that coral skeleton. Um, some sort of Valvatita spun, I mean, sea star, and we also have a, actually, let me make sure. Yeah, that looks like a Valvatita sea star, and then under it looks like some sort of basket star. Wow. And all of these organisms are coexisting next to each other. It's really... Personally, it's really surprising for me to see these all together. Oh, and then to our right, we have, um, mm -hmm. looks and like... Coral. There yeah. were more corals off to the left as well, I think. Really? Oh, I my gosh. I believe. It's like a brittle or basket star on there. Yeah. So we got all the sea stars in this one view. Oh, yeah, I see them. Yeah. Um, this coral looks like it's... Uh, let me just make sure. That might be a black coral um a type of black coral most likely actually can't quite see it yet okay zoom in can't get a great view here I okay. mean rocks on there yeah um actually probably another from noah <laughs> Yeah, it looks like another primnoid, perhaps. And then an associate on it, another um, brittle star. Awesome zoom, thank you. Okay, full then, wide. If we can, if we're not behind on the ship, are we, Cheyenne? Yeah, Yay, we're way behind. behind. All right, <laughs> let's catch up. <laughs> There's That's a too lot bad, of yeah, there were nice ones over there. Yeah, oh, and it looks like, just um, like a quick note, it looks like that crinoid that we just passed it looked like it could have been one of the decapitated ones that is regrowing and oh my gosh there's so much um i was corrected that stock crinoids actually when they're decapitated like that which we have no idea who's doing the decapitating but when they're decapitated like that actually sometimes they're we've seen um we've seen them regrowing like there's a little star oh there's another basket star on the oh there's the shark surface. Oh, oh yeah? yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay. Is it a shark? Or that's not Eel. a shark. That's an ophitted. I think that's an ophitted, but we can keep moving. Oh, this is cool. Another Euplectelid. Oh, wow. oh, and that you is. You see that one sponge? Oh my gosh. In a Go ahead right. and zoom. That is a ferret sponge yeah. with an associate on it. With wow, two associates on that's it. That's neat. Do we want to keep moving the ship or do we want to stop and let Atalanta um, swing forward? It's up to science. We're fine. If, we, if you want to keep scooting ahead. You can, yeah, you can keep moving. It's okay. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, so this is amazing. a really cool type of shrimp. Uh, shrimp. Oh, my gosh. Sponge. <laughs> <laughs> um, most likely part of Faradaydae. I mean, Faradaydae. Um, with a feather star on it and a brittle star on it. We have a good enough zoom. I think we can keep moving. Okay. Full wide. And this was that little sponge in the back we saw. Yeah, that was uh, most likely a euplectelid. It looked like from its, um, it was stalked and it was blobby and it looked like it kind of had some like concavity to it. So that's why I'm thinking it's a euplectelid. And now we shift change.
Oh, so for those of you who are tuning in and seeing the magnificent wonders in the ocean, welcome aboard the exploration vessel Nautilus. And we are currently in an area of the ocean that is within the Pacific Islands Marine National Monument, or rather just right outside of that area. And we are exploring a deep ocean today. We're about 1,125 meters below the seafloor on top of an unnamed seamount. And we can see that we are exploring a variety of areas. So stay tuned to witness more underwater wonders. And we'll be shipping over to our next team. And if you have any questions and if you're interested in learning more about the undersea world as we explore, feel free to go on our website and to uh, log in and check in the chat. We are open to having questions for our scientists here aboard. On this dive, we have been uh, we have been testing a new instrument on our ROV, which is a raw spectrometer, and this is a tool that helps us analyze the chemical makeup of rocks without directly uh, having to take a sample. And we had some trouble shooting throughout the day, having to uh, take the ROV out of the water and then put it back in the second time after some troubleshooting. And we were able to get that calibrated and now it's uh, officially ready for official use on our ROV dives. This is an instrument that is is going to help us tremendously when identifying uh, great rocks for us to take for samples. This is an instrument that's also used out in space on many different Mars rovers. It can one day be used to explore the ocean worlds like Europa and Enceladus around the planets Jupiter and Saturn. Video watch change. So this looks like most to be fourteen hour dive today. So Feel free to tune in, tune out, and take a nap, have a nice dinner, and then come on back. We'll be here for you. Just sit back, relax, and enjoy the dive. Any occasional good joke, too. Hello, front row. Are you all holding for um, changeover, or are you taking requests? Taking requests. Can we go see if that rock right there is... Um uh, collectible? Yeah, sure. Let me just back up a hair and see what I'm going to sit on because we've got all the expensive stuff on the back. All right. Try and get in there. Good question. Uh, really started out with COVID. Um, <laughs> Funny enough, I got started through COVID and it got me into video production. And then from there, yep. And from there, I uh, learned a lot of skills from because a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff ends up um, being during COVID. There's a lot of video production stuff that you could do because people couldn't go out, and so it's kind of cool to be able to uh, go out and film it and have people at home be able to watch it live. And from there, I gained skill and decided to go to MTSU, Middle Tennessee State University. And from there, uh, slowly progressed, and I got to the point where it's like uh, where I am now, where I ended up joining everyone on the crew of the Nautilus, all from COVID, crazy <laughs> enough. You will never hear me utter the sentence, thank you, COVID. For me, it ended up being a benefit, and uh, you know, at the same time, I didn't 
don't like COVID, but at the same time, it got me in my career where I am now. So I'm thankful for it. At the same time, I don't like it. Silver lining kind of thing, yeah. A positive came out of a negative. Yeah. Oh, hello there. Oh, oh is this so good, old friend? It's little friend. Look, it's a cool friend. That's Look a squid of some type. Ooh. <laughs> you said that so sadly. It's a squid. <laughs> no, I don't mean that. I just don't. It might be a piglet squid, but I'm not. <gasps> piglet sure. squid. He's so like. I just want to kind of go squeeze him and see if all the <laughs> if all the air is gonna come out of him. Like he looks like a giant air balloon. Squeeze the ink out of. Oh, <laughs> it made me ink. <laughs> <laughs> all eyes are closing. Oh, no, buddy. Brian, what is a piglet squid? Uh, Besides a squid. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. It's a piglet squid. <laughs> I've seen, okay, so I know that they have seen like white piglet squids, but this is my first time to see like a red piglet squid. Yeah, I'm, I'm Googling and I'm not, I agree. Um, I'm used to seeing a whiter one, but squids obviously are one of those things that can often change colors too, so. So new highlight of the, of the shift, piglet squid. Not that anyone cares, but I dressed up as a confetti squid for uh, Halloween this past <laughs> year. <laughs> what is a confetti squid? It's super fun. It has like these little specks that kind of make it look like confetti. Oh. Very pretty. They are beautiful. Is this something from like colder climates? Oh no, they're in the deep sea. Yeah. So. So how are you a confetti squid? Did you have like a one of those hefty trash bags over you with like confetti glued on it? No, I bought this like <laughs> <laughs> it was like a I bought this like outfit that had all of these little um like confetti looking things on it. I don't know uh -huh. how to like all these like shimmery things and I wore that and then I got a squid hat that <laughs> could light up, which was super fun. So at night I would turn it on and it would blink. Uh-huh. Um, that's, that was my, that was my costume. I think that's an awesome costume. I know, and I'm super excited to have that squid hat now. <laughs> <laughs> I love hearing everybody's like Halloween costumes that works on the Nautilus, because it always seems like there's definitely a deep sea theme or a Nautilus themed. This one was definitely deep sea themed. Uh, my friends and I all decided to dress up as deep sea creatures, so... One of my roommates was a vampire squid. One was a goblin shark. Yeah, another, there was another uh, confetti squid with us, too. Sounds like great evidence that biology is better. The geologists all dressed up as, as biology. Yeah, I was going to say, what the heck? Okay, first of all, one was not actually a researcher. And then one is a biologist, and the other one is a biologist and ocean engineer. Mm -hmm. So, But still, nobody's dressing up as rocks. I mean, I'll do that next year. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be a diamond. Ooh, I was going to say you could be pharaoh manganese with <laughs> bestials. <laughs> what is, what is that? Is that the pair, is that a paragord? Well, it's dead, whatever it is. Oh, R.A.P. But it looks like it might be a corallid skeleton, which is not something we've seen yet. So we'll have to be on the lookout for some precious corals here at some point. There are other things that leave skeletons kind of like that too, so that's definitely not guaranteed. But we'll keep our eye out. And a couple other paramarissias here. Nice little Chrysogorgia over there on the side. 
So one of our online viewers might have the winner for the deep sea costume. They put fish fins on their corgi's harness and called it a cuttlefish. Aww. Oh, rat tail, right? Yep, macaroid. So Brian, an online question that we got is, since we're trying to figure out what is eating the heads off of the crinoids, can you sample, like cut off the, the head of one of them and try to figure it out that way or slurp, slurp up some eDNA around it? Probably not. We're not really at that level of ability to do any kind of forensics analysis. Like eDNA is only gonna tell us what was in the area recently. And so, um, you know, we might could see that there were different types of fish in the area, but the causality of what's eating the crinoid would definitely not come out in an eDNA sample. Um, and I don't think we're anywhere near the ability to like swab the tip of the crinoid stalk and then, you know, amplify the DNA without a whole bunch of contamination. So no, I don't think short of sticking some cameras down here, staring at a crinoid and doing a time lapse for a long period of time hoping the one crinoid we're staring at gets eaten. <laughs> I don't really know how to check that out. That's how I would go about it is I'd put a camera down, a, t a long duration time lapse camera pointed at the densest aggregation of crinoids I could find. Can we check out the sponge please? I thought I heard somebody come in. I thought I heard that too. Yeah. So I think this is some type of euplectelid sponge. don't think I'll go past family on this one. Um, but this is another one of those glass sponges, one of the simplest um, members of the animal phyla, and yet remarkably complex when you actually start getting into the details of them. All right, thanks, Dan. I think we're good. What makes them complex? Well, they've been long regarded as like the most basal of animals on in Animalia um, because they have... Uh, you know, I think I have, they have such simple tissue types. They really just filter, feed, and they don't do a whole lot. Um, and the more and more we look at them, the more we realize they have remarkably simplistic, but yet um, very effective mechanisms for immune systems and stuff like that that were originally weren't appreciated. So another nice little cluster of corals and crinoids here several more primnoids. This is this is the shallowest depth um, by a good little bit. We've seen this expedition. You can see the, the transition to a lot more of the primnoids and paramercias here than we've seen on the last two dives. We're not going to get pretty much any shallower here. We're going to be kind of going up and down uh, two kind of hills, for lack of a better word. Um, as we move across this dive. So we're currently at, where are we? At? We're at 1118 meters subsurface. Um, and we've been more or less within 30 meters or so of that since the entire, since we came on watch. So we have a question from an online viewer and I'm not sure who to throw it to. So open to the entire van. Uh, how do we use those, those two green lasers at the front to determine the size of different organisms? Well, the lasers are spaced 10 centimeters apart. So if you can kind of just, so like wherever you see those lasers pointing, that's 10 centimeters apart. So then that crinoid would be about 
70, 80 centimeters. Hey, actually, Dan, before you leave, can we look at this? Uh, yes, potentially. It's kind of hard to tell because I think we're looking at it from a weird angle, mm -hmm. but um, once you get up next to it. Oh, this is what I thought it was. Sweet. Basket star. What? The whole thing? Yep. Oh, my. Maybe, maybe more than one. But oh, my. I know. Wow. I think it's just one. Oh, my. At Atlanta. <laughs> yep. This, this is, is a, big. This is a very, that's, I think that's more arms than I've ever seen on a basket star before. But these oh are a technically type of brittle star called a basket star. And they have these repeated multiple bifurcating arms. Um, and they're filter feeders. They throw all their arms out and filter the air. No, a lot of times you see them much more curled up. But I, I love these things. They're really cool. And it's brown. This is our very first organism that we've seen that's brown down here, right? Like it just looks like twigs and sticks. Yeah. All these little critters that are flying by, little shrimp or some other things, it always fascinates me. I always want to know what they are. Like, And I know a lot of them are marine snow, but I'm going, some of them have got to be something else. So as our, my shore base fact checker, who I swear is keeping score of the number of times he can tell me I'm wrong in a dive, which is a good thing, which <laughs> science is always about learning and changing. Um, so I appreciate always learning from Steve, has also just sent me a paper that there is now a debate on whether the tenophores are actually more basal than the sponges, um, and maybe the kind of, and maybe a sister group to uh, all other animals. I have heard about this, and I find it so interesting, because I teach about the phylogenetic tree, and how I teach the phylogenetic tree might be completely changing in 10 years or shorter. Yep. Here's a nice little urchent. That's another one that looks a little bit brownish. Dan, the current flow is more or less left to right from, correct? Okay. So all these Can we stop the ship?
So any of those will probably work if you want to poke around and see which one's free. Anything, you know, cantaloupe-sized and angular is kind of the motto of the rock collecting for this cruise. Okay. Video mic check. Check one, two. What about this one? I don't know how angular it is. Yay or nay? We'll say nay. Yay? Yay. Yay. All right. So if we can, if you mind pulling a little bit closer to the camera and spinning it for us one more time once we finished our data, tran data logger handover, we'll sure. snap a couple images. Sure thing. All right, let me know when you're good, Chris. All right, we are good. If you want to throw it in a box. All right. And what's the sample number? This uh, should be. This should Can be I the see the arm in the, the bubble cam? Oh, you got it. Yeah. Oh, it's gone over there. Okay, let's see what this does for us. And yeah, can you change that port rail camera to the other box one? There we go. Okay. All right, um, box out. I guess it's how to Dealer's choice, I guess, eh? It's all empty. Yep, all empty. So, out all the way. All the way. There we go. I think it'll go in there. What do you think? It's going to be close. No. Oh. Okay. Yes. yes. Yay for Yay, you know, maximizing don't try. use of boxes. Perfect. All right, so box that in. is box in. Yep, that is one rock. Uh, sample zero three two. First sample of the day. Is that in box in? That is in that one. Change that camera back. Sure. Heard fault. Well, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. The four to eight watch is just taking over in the control van. We are kind of near the top of uh, unnamed GEO uh, in the U.S. exclusive economic zone around uh, Kingman and Palmyra. We're about 125 nautical miles north-northwest of Kingman. Um, we have spent most of this dive so far doing some engineering trial and testing of uh, the, the uh, new Raman spectrometer that we are trialing on um, this expedition. Um, and now we're finished our sea trials for it for the day. And now we're setting off to do a little exploring. We're expected to recover in about eight hours um, around midnight ship time. And we'll get back to exploring just as soon as we finish um, pass over between the 12 to 4 watch and the 4 to 8 watch.
hello, quick comm check. Test one, two. I hear you, Dan. Uh, boat looks like it's not moving at the moment. So. Uh, I hear you, Daryl. If everybody's ready to go, I'll go ahead and start the boat moving again. Sure. Where are we going? What are we doing? <laughs> We're just uh, tracking west. Roger. We're kind of going, we're going to go down and then a little bit up. We're pretty much staying at the top of the seamount, though, so not too much elevation change. Oh, my God. Look at this crazy Z bias this kid's got. Okay. I'm going to do uh, what we call a subsea milking of the craft. Can you tell us what is that move? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm a farmer by day, so they, uh, oh my gosh, she's about, hold on. So as Dan is making this really complex move, for our viewers listening in at home, it is the moment you have all been waiting for. The four to eight dream shift yeah. is on the shift. I've been anxious to get down here for two days now. So that way we can be exploring, testing out the, the Raman spectrometer, seeing some cool, amazing critters like that one flying into the sea right now. Taking it over to biologist Brian. Any idea? Fish. <laughs> <laughs> but that's all I got. Biologist Brian, thank you so much. So I know we do this every night, but if y'all guys will just mind saying your name and what your role is on the Nautilus. So I'll go first. I'm Katie, I'm the Science Communication Fellow, and yep, tossing it over to Corley. Hi everyone, I'm Corley Rodriguez. I am a graduate student at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. Uh, I study geological oceanography, and specifically I study ferromanganese crust, which is these black rocks that you're looking at right now. Um, what else are we, oh, are we supposed to say anything else? I guess that's it. That's perfect. Good job, Corley. <laughs> I figured everybody's tired of saying the same thing over and over again. Ooh, for our 4 a.m. Yep. 8 a.m. Actually, you know what? Let's add something in. What's your favorite cookie? Favorite cookie? Yes. Oh, uh, gosh. Going to go really basic. Oatmeal chocolate chip. My mom has this really good yes. recipe that I like. will just make and keep in the freezer. And as we discussed, that is my favorite also. I love oatmeal chocolate chip. Brian. Hello, everyone. I'm Brian Kennedy. I'm a deep sea benthic ecologist uh, and chief scientist at the Ocean Discovery League and affiliate researcher at Boston University. Uh, I am the biological sciences lead for the expedition and the watch lead for the four to eight. Um, cookie would have to be even more basic, and I'm just going to go with the straight chocolate chip. Mm. The, the cookie that we're all craving and yeah. longing for, and every day we get our hopes up, and then our dreams get crushed. Except oatmeal yeah, you can't say they get crushed because the oatmeal raisins are quite tasty. They are good. They are good. All right, Chris. Uh, yeah, hello, everybody. I'm Chris. I'm the data logger for 4 to 8 shift. Um, oh, my favorite cookie. Uh, the oatmeal raisins are pretty good, but I also huh. really like those snickerdoodles. It was another two discarium. The floating alien thing from our first dive. <gasps> no way! Really? I'm pretty sure one just buzzed through uh, Herc HD. Wow. So cool. I was uh, hot rodding there. I don't know what's around. <laughs> so snickerdoodles are my mom's favorite cookies, Chris. They're pretty nice. delicious. I love them. They are good. So throwing it down to Daryl. Now, Daryl, I know you were like juggling between five things. Hello, I'm Daryl. Um, they're video intern, currently working on feeds and audio, making sure everyone sounds good, hopefully, today. Everyone does not sound good. They're all wonky. I know. I'm trying to fix it. <laughs> I'm actively fixing that. Sorry right, about that. Got to rebalance all the levels after we took our masks off. Oh, yeah. It's, I'm completely changing out people's voices. Data, I just added, increasing your voice a little bit. Ooh. Anyway, my favorite is, like, the chunky... Uh, uh, Chocolate chip, like big chunks of chocolate oh, in it, okay. instead so of just regular. 
Controversial question. Dark chocolate or regular? Both. You can't go wrong with either one. <laughs> Sorry. I love it. You were like, I'm going to be Switzerland on this policy. So, Ren, are you okay with answering that question? I know front row is always busy doing about a million things. Uh, yeah. For favorite cookie. And a quick introduction about yourself, sir. Oh, okay. Hi, uh, I'm Ren. I'm the current Atalanta pilot and ROV I engineering intern. Come and down five meters, please, right? Copy. <laughs> so we just had a person online comment that there is such a thing called the banana oatmeal chocolate chip. That sounds awesome. We're going to try that. Can you make those boxes uh, 10 meters or whatever? There's a, some function to do that. So, banana oatmeal chocolate chip person, you have just rocked my world. I can't when I hear get you. home making some cookies. Uh, whatever you got to do to make them 10 meters. There you go. I use that as a uh, judge to see, for example. Uh, Ren, come down another uh, five meters. So I'm getting drug here. So Cheyenne, since I know our ROV pilots are busy doing their jobs and piloting the ROVs, can We're you not, tell us who you are in this and case. favorite cookie and what you're doing here? Sure. Uh, my name's Cheyenne Waters. I'm from the Coast Guard Academy, and I'm currently the navigator. Um, and my favorite cookie is chocolate chip. So, so far, the only one who's had like a different one is either oatmeal raisin or snickerdoodle. Wait, who said oatmeal raisin? I'm trying to throw oatmeal raisin love. Nope. No. <laughs> <laughs> there is somebody on this ship whose favorite cookie is oatmeal raisin. I will not name who. Oh, I have to know. I figured you would. So I'm like, is this going to create the the drama on the yeah. ship? Oh, Corley, yeah. yeah. Corley versus whoever likes oatmeal raisin. Yeah. <laughs> so to everybody at home, one of the amazing things about the Nautilus is everybody works together. We all pretty much get along. There's... There's zero drama, zero contentious. It is absolutely the opposite of every reality TV show ever because everybody's just positive and works together. So sometimes we kind of miss a little bit of the drama. So Coralie's going to go after whoever's favorite <laughs> is oatmeal raisin. I have to find out. That will be our drama for the next two days. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Nav, when you get a second, can you tell us the range to waypoint two? Yeah. Just gonna zoom out. Okay, you can, uh, well, hold on a second. Why? Wow. So for those at home, we do have some big old bright lights on the front of Atalanta and Hercules. So normally the deep sea would not be quite this illuminated. Uh, it would be pitch black. However, again, we have those big bright lights so it is kind of making it look like we're higher up in the water column than we actually are. So great question online. Uh, about 450 meters to a point two. Okay, thanks. So we're almost three fourths of a mile down. 1,200 feet, 1,100 feet. You can uh, change that thing, the screen background to black too, please, or some dark color. All right. Go. Thank you. Are we good to keep heading west? Sure. If I can ever get where I'm trying to go, seems like. Bridge now. Can we move another five zero meters at two six zero degrees and point two knots? Thank you. 
So Cheyenne, we hear you call a uh, bridge nav so many times and say move 0 0.5 knots. Can you tell us like what is what are you corresponding to them about? What are you asking for? What are they doing? And why do we need to do it? Yeah, so basically the ship is not using its main engine. It is using a dynamic positioning system. And that means that we're facing into the wind to keep the ship super stable. And we're just moving like tiny little thrusters a little bit at a time. And Atalanta is hooked on a tether to the ship. So she only moves with the ship. So we need to, if we want to continue to move towards our target goals, we have to keep moving the ship. So right now you were saying that we're using DP dynamic positioning. Is this yep. something that in the Coast Guard Academy that you use or that you will potentially use? Um, so ships usually use this for docking. Uh, we do not use this at the Academy. Our training boats are not that fancy. <laughs> DP, Thank you, Cheyenne. DP is really kind of a magic technology. Um, and, and what it does is that you, you actually have a three-dimensional model of the ship built into the uh, ship's computer system. It has wind sensors around the vessel. And it calculates the cross-sectional area the wind is interacting with on the ship. And it'll actually apply thruster force to counteract the motion of the ship before it starts. So it's responding to the environment um, before the ship even starts moving as well. I mean, also, if the ship moves, it'll compensate for that as, as well, but it actually it tries to be anticipatory of what forces are acting on the ship before it even starts to moving. Nautilus is 60-something meters long and uh, can very readily hold station, you know, within one or two meters, um, which is pretty amazing, even up into 20 knots of wind. So we got a nice little group of corals here. Uh, we've Ooh. got these... Um, We've got a couple primnoids there that are probably uh, norella. We've got a couple paramaricea. And we've seen, the, continuing to see these continuous uh, phyrocrinidae um, stalked crinoids. Um, looks like we've got a shrimp flying through. We've got one little hexactinellid sponge in there. Um, nice little community. But I think we've gotten good looks at all of these so far. So let's make some tracks and try and head on over to waypoint two. Roger. Zoom out on Argus, please. Uh, Atlanta. Yeah, we've been seeing entire fields of crinoids down here. Or this at least it looked that way when we were watching it in the in the lounge earlier. This has been like the crinoid dive, or crinoid couple dives, actually. We've seen a yeah, lot of them. Yeah, yeah. We saw so many on the... Uh, 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. watch the other day. Crinoids le need love too, I guess. Oh, I'm loving all the cookie suggestions that we're getting online. Cranberries, chopped pecans, s milk, semi-sweet chocolate chips, chocolate fudge cookies. Chocolate fudge, making me hungry now. I know. <laughs> I'm like, I kind of regret this decision. <laughs> Cause I am, I'm reading all these and I'm like, oh, that sounds really good. I want to make these. Maybe in three weeks. That is some serious current there. If you're drifting, do you have a speed indication? You can give us an estimation of it. Yeah, Herc, uh, I used to on the old nav screen. I don't know, where is my speed now? Where's her speed on here? I'm not speed sure. Speed over there. Well, it used to be right up in here somewhere. I haven't looked at it on this new. I would say that's close to a knot there. Okay, thanks. That's one of my wish lists for new technologies is better current monitoring on um, ROVs, to have an upward-looking DVL that can back the ship's, the ROV's motion out and give me an accurate current reading would be really nice. Uh, get on the Valleyport website. That technology's been around for decades. Oh, no. I mean, you're right. Sorry. I knew it existed. <laughs> and we just, no research ROV I've ever encountered has it. Yeah, standard equipment on a... Usually on the tether management on the TMS. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. That's totally fine with me for what I need for science. So how strong do the currents get here in the deep sea? 
Are they stronger than, like, say, currents at the surface of the water? No. Um, wandering very quickly outside my realm of expertise, um, but, you know, a strong current is about one knot or something um, for the most part. You do get strange events where you get, um, or not, not even that strange, but they're strange compared to um, how often we see them. But you can get what are known as benthic storms. Uh, yeah, you can out. get... Um, Hard I never heard coral of that. That's so cool. Um, hot, <laughs> excuse me. Hard current changes um, in certain places where internal waves break and stuff like that. And so, uh, I know I was working in the Mona Channel between um, Dominican Republic and, Co and uh, Puerto Rico once, and some we just had this current storm hit, and the vehicle couldn't navigate. The, we had to just pin the vehicle on the ground on the seafloor and wait 15 or 20 minutes for this current storm to pass before we could even navigate the vehicle safely again. And that was probably two and a half, three knots at least. Um, and it just came and went suddenly. Um, so there's a lot of, there can be pretty strong currents down here. But Do we know what causes those? <sighs> I would have to go look up the details to understand the physics of deep sea oceanography get can complicated real quick. Um, but you still see changes in tidal cycles down here. You see internal waves. Um, so a lot of these things end up, you know, you see them generally stronger in, um, in association with, um, I can't talk today, uh, steeper seafloor. So it gets channeled somewhere. You have a gentle motion that gets channeled down through a canyon or something like that and then hits you. Um, and, but you can get standing waves or seaches in the deep sea as well, which can break and stuff like that. Um, it gets into way too much fluid dynamics math for my taste to truly understand it. Nice little patch again here of these uh, crinoids we're seeing. This looks like a nope. chrysogorget here in the center with its uh, Europtychus um, associate, or squat lobster. You'll see these. Um, a fair number of these crinoids are headless. They've been decapitated by something. And this is a ongoing curiosity for me is what is decapitating these crinoids? And I don't know of it ever having been witnessed, um, but I gotta, I'm curious. I'm assuming it, it's some kind of mobile predator that bites them off, but. I know we're gonna be coming around the bend and it's just no Pocahontas reference there. And we're just going to see this really cool creature just eating it, like mid-bite. That would be, that would make me very happy. So we got a nice little collection here of um, primnoids, these white corals down here. Um, that yellow coral on the right side of that little boulder is likely some kind of paramecia. Um, the taxonomists once again are messing with me, and I would have called this a plexorid a year ago, but they've renamed this group. Well, actually, they've split a lot of the uh, genera out of the plexorids into the paramaricea. Um, and so I'm still having to get in the habit of updating my taxonomy for them. This could also be an acanthogorgid. They're tricky to tell apart. Those three families are Zoom in, please, um, very difficult for me to tell them apart. Yeah, I think this is probably a type of paramercia, but I would not be at all surprised if somebody in the chat tells me it's actually an acanthogorgia. But that's good for us to make an ID later. Thank you. Roger. <coughs> okay, you can go ahead. So, Brian, you keep talking about how taxol taxonomists are messing with you and everything is like... <laughs> so and it's happening right and now. And getting yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so as we're as I'm talking, my favorite taxonomist is typing to me that Acanthogorgia has now been rolled into Paramaricia, and so I can just call them all Paramaricia and be fine. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Steve. <laughs> so why is it that these corals are constantly getting renamed, shifted genus, shifted families? And this Steve, is, I know this Steve, is the bane of your existence. Uh, and answer this question. <laughs> yes, yeah, Steve. Um, SPL. The um, basically, it's it's a shortage of data and and a new insights with genetics is doing a lot. 
And so um, as we understand a lot of this has come from morphology or the st structure and shape of um, these organisms. And as we're looking at them from a genetics point of view, uh, it's giving us different information. And sometimes what we thought looked very similar and likely were very closely related genetically look very different. And it's more of an example of convergent evolution um, that making them look more similar because that body form works for the environment they live in, even though they come from pretty um, pretty different um, evolutionary histories. You can see that just looking at, in some ways, an umbelula, uh, umbelopathies, and a metallogorgia all have, and really these crinoids we're seeing, all have kind of very similar gross body plans, but come from very different um, evolutionary backgrounds. And that I feel like has been one of the themes of the past couple of days. Convergent evolution. Coralie, oh, yeah, let's take a look at the sea oh. star, please. This is that same, looks like that same sea star that we've seen a couple times now with the kind of pink center body with the whiter colored arms. Go ahead, Daryl. This one's got, well actually this one's got spikes. I don't remember the one yesterday having individual Take spikes on it. Take a push in some more there. Ooh, the camera's fast tonight. All right, that's good for us. Okay, can go away. So you'll definitely hear as we go along that we don't know the IDs and taxonomies of all of these things. We're looking across multiple phyla here, and when we go to annotate this video after, um, after the expedition, we'll go through the video and then outsource IDs to numerous different experts um, to actually help us get the IDs from these things. The echinoderms will probably will call you know Dr. Chris Moth, the Smithsonian. Um, there's a whole bunch of whole, you know, international network of taxonomists who specialize in their own specific taxa um, that broader ecologists like me rely on completely to help uh, understand what we're looking at uh, at the individual species and genus level. Uh, and that work is critical for being, you know, basing the work I do looking at larger patterns of biodiversity across you know, multiple regions and stuff like that. So I will take all the taxa we document here, you know, in the order of probably 100 plus, uh, and put that into, you know, my analysis pipeline, however, depending on the research question we're doing. Um, so while I struggle to ID a lot of these things much past family level, um, you know, it, it's really a team effort, and you almost never see... Um, a deep sea paper with only one or two authors. There are normally five to 20 or 30 um, that have to contribute. And that's just amongst the biology. If you start layering in the mapping and the physical oceanography uh, and all the technology required to get us here, it's a, it's a huge team effort across many, many disciplines uh, in order to get, to do good deep sea science. And that brings up a, uh, a good point. So Corley, we have taken so many rock samples over the past couple of dives. Um, and I know during the day we have gone out there, split them in half with the rocks. Is there anything that you have found that's particularly interesting or something that's been surprising down here for you? Um, well, I, <laughs> I haven't actually been looking at the rocks so much. <laughs> She's group. been doing some amazing interactions with uh, <laughs> but the other SCFs. I will say one thing that was kind of cool that I didn't even notice until the interaction we did today was uh, you can't really see this in the rocks now, but so and beneath all of this ferromanganese crust, which is the black stuff we're looking at now, um, is a volcanic rock because these seamounts are essentially volcanic underwater mountains. And uh, when you cut open the rock, then you can see the inside volcanic rock um, in it. And when other SCF, Daniel, was showing us the rock, there were these tiny little bubbles, which are called vesicles. 
Um, and that's essentially where, you know, these these gases were trying to escape as you bring up, as you bring the rock up through uh, kind of like the mantle and like through the, you know, little tube that the, <laughs> that the lava comes out of, uh, gas will try to escape. And so the bubbles can become big mm -hmm. um, as you take away the pressure of it. And so those bubbles, those gas bubbles actually clue us into a lot, a lot, a lot about um, the mechanisms of formation of the lava. Um, maybe it can clue us into what type of eruption it was. Um, there's a lot you can learn. Uh, my lab mates are way more into that um, side of mm -hmm. geochemistry than I am, but can we look it's at definitely cool. <laughs> Corley, what input are you on? She's I'm on, on a, a belt pack. Yeah, belt pack. That explains a lot. Belt pack one or two. Uh, I'd have to look at it. Let's see. I don't want to grab your waistline. <laughs> Sorry, you were peeking pretty heavily, and I want to make sure you don't, so people can understand you. Uh, belt pack one. Belt pack one. Can you go ahead and speak? Hello. <laughs> or I guess I should say test. Test. You're good. There we go. Ooh. Thank Dan, you. can we look at one of these decapitated crinoid stalks when you get a chance, or one or two? I want to see if they're what they look like. So, Corley, I'm so glad you were talking about the rocks because that's something that I feel biology always takes center stage. And it's so great that on this expedition, geology is sharing that stage, sharing that limelight. And I even helped cut those rocks. And I never <laughs> even. All the stuff that you were talking about, I was like, yep, that looks like a rock. And then you're like, there's vesicles. And then this has a, a little trace amount of mineral. So you were seeing something that I clearly saw and never, ever got to just never even realized it was there. So I love all the different viewpoints that allow us to, to just register science on different levels. And so this looks like a paramorsia with a Venus flytrap anemone. The darker color one is po probably a paracliptrophora and the whiter one is probably a Calyptrophora or maybe a Norella, and then a couple more Paramaricia up on top. Uh, and then we got a nice little Chrysogorgia down there on the side. This is a, a nice little um, biodiverse single rock here. Got a couple little sponges around there as well. And is that a shrimp or? Yep, okay. looks like that little red thing looks like a shrimp to me. Another Chrysogorgia of some type in the crack, along with potentially either a Norella or a, a Calyptrophora. So, Chris, we have an online question for you. Uh, is your definition of snickerdoodle cookie a cinnamon sugar cookie or a peanut butter cookie? Can we zoom on the head of one of these two? <laughs> Can we zoom on the he the decapitated head of one of those two stalked crinoids? <laughs> Let's say a cinnamon sugar cookie. <laughs> <laughs> but peanut Thanks, butter Chris. Good too. <laughs> yeah, peanut see, butters are awesome too. Here's a cool little shot here where this stalked crinoid has been decapitated by, I'm assuming, some type of predator. But if you look there, it's starting to regrow and it's got wee little arms. Yeah, it has <laughs> a little tiny head. The opposite of a T Rex. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're good. Thanks, Dan. It looks like that whole forest of crinoids. That's yeah, awesome. But oh wow! So a lot of them, it looks like, don't have a he head, arms. Yep. Right. <laughs> but then on the other side, there. Oh my gosh! There's so many of them. <laughs> yeah, I really want to know what's eating that, eating those. Yeah. But if you can't see and you do everything by basically chance of bumping into something tasty, you wouldn't necessarily know there's another crinoid, you know, right next to you that you could swim over and eat. It's one of those things a lot of a lot of thinking about the ocean in general, the deep sea in particular, like you're reliant on senses 
that aren't very natural to humans. So trying to understand how the ecosystems work here re relies on a lot of technology um, to kind of visualize and understand things we don't see. We can't see nutrient concentrations. It's hard for us to even see currents. Um, it, you know, we can't see pressure sent the pressure waves floating around as that you know fish and all the creatures down here are extremely sensitive to changes in pressure not even like depth pressure but like the lateral lines of fish being able to sense um, pressure motion through the water there's a whole host of sensory systems humans lack that are required to understand life in the ocean so you've been blowing my mind with all these facts benthic storms benthic currents pressure changes all this going on in the deep sea and then you get into like not only that you just see the interaction of the seafloor so we generally talk about the benthic boundary layer being the water mass that's within a couple meters of the seafloor behaves differently than the uh, um, water mass above it so you get a secondary interaction where if you have a current pushing through an area it hits the benthic boundary layer changes and then that affects the benthic boundary layer and then that hits the actual um, thing and so and that changes with the amounts of uh, every factor possible interaction how that thing you can get a l different nutrients trapped right in the benthic boundary layer near the seafloor um, so it, it is it's infinitely complicated in a lot of ways so there's no hard fast rule like a um, hydrocline uh, I mean th there there certainly are like the kind of fundamental physical properties of ocean uh, water that behave in certain ways um, unquestionably but so many little nuanced things affect it that the real world application of the theory is always so much more complicated look at all these crinoids I know I don't only remember seeing crinoids this dense once or twice um, elsewhere and I don't remember I frankly don't remember where those were The more we go through, the more I think about what you said. Why is it that there's so many crinoids here, but not coral? And then at another place, there's so many corals, but there's zero crinoids. Steve makes a good point in the chat, too, um, thinking about potentially the predators on these crinoids being snails. And it may actually be a much smaller um, organism that's eating them piecemeal, or small pieces are potentially in the eating them, knocking off the fronds and having them fall away might be another method of predation down here. Instead of it being a larger organism taking the whole head in one bite, it could be a smaller, um, almost more parasite type thing eating it off in pieces. So Brian, I take it you keep up with current events? But I'm bumped. Mm. <laughs> 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 that was from a viewer online. You can thank them. <laughs> I try to, but I have to admit, reading physical oceanography papers, the math gets over my head real quick. Oh my gosh, physical oceanography was a bane of my existence my first year in grad school. So going back to the crinoid predation, how? So we're seeing the the heads of the crinoid start popping back That's out. That's new. Can we check? that out please but they're a growing back how much of a crinoid needs to be eaten before they won't grow back anymore I don't know but it's surprisingly <laughs> little I mean if you think about the if it can lose its entire feeding appendage um, you know everything it uses to eat and capture food which makes up I don't know probably 50% of its mass can be eaten and it grows back I'm pretty impressed especially when you look at um, I'm not a hundred percent sure what this is. I'm going to venture it's a paracliptophora that's not doing so well. It's got some hydroids overgrowing it there in the center. It's definitely got some dead um, fronds and a little paramercia over here on the right. Steve says he agrees. Um, all right, we're good. Thank you.
That's a great shot of uh, Hercules from Atalanta. Oh, so as you, if you look at the Atalanta view, you see the currents, uh, the bed forms over here. We were talking about them a lot. So I didn't went and actually did a little research about the symmetrical versus asymmetrical current versus waves thing that came up in conversation the other day. So the basically the pattern in terms of it being parallel or cross-hatched is controlled by the direction of flow, but the shape of the wave is controlled by the the consistency of the direction. So if it's a consistent direction as in current flow, it is an asymmetrical wave. But if it's a w if it's wave generated, you get a symmetrical shape to the actual ripple. Wow. The more you know. The more you know. <laughs> yeah, where's our little star going over our head? I'm having trouble telling. So Brian, this one that might, I know this is a, your area of expertise is so broad, but we had a question online that is asking that they've heard about research into human muscle regeneration studying echinoderms. Has this research shown any promise that you know of? I have no idea. Oh, look at how, look at the current. That's actually interesting. Look at that. The, the, the heads that have the crinoids that have heads are stable, and the crinoids that don't have heads are shaking in the current. Interesting. That's an interesting kind of hydrodynamic d thing in its own that they're self-stabilizing in the current when they're fully, when they're not eaten. So Daryl, I want to ask you a question because I feel like you're one of those unsung heroes. You're always making sure that everything looks good, but you are so busy that it's hard for you to get a chance to, to speak. Will you tell us a little bit about uh, the career that's led you to the Nautilus? Crinoids are lined up in the same direction with their facing away from the current, mm. with the current coming in from their underside, more or less, for lack of a better way to describe it. I'd say a good 15 to 20 percent of these things are have had their heads bitten off. Sneaking up and just biting them off. This brown coral here is also a member of the family Primnoidae, um, probably a Paracliptophora. Another Venus flytrap an enemy there.
forest of crinoids. So I did notice we're seeing a lot of the same species um, down here. Do you think we'll be able to see these particular species the higher we go in elevation? So they're the, the clearest zonation in the ocean is pretty much by depth. Right. And so as we go up and down, we definitely see fairly rapid turnover in species. Um, they really are zoned by depth quite substantial um, okay um, so the wind is getting not going to be going up much here that we're going to be kind of holding a pretty right. steady um depth throughout this entire dive so we'll probably stay more or less in, in a similar community of organisms yeah so um the wind is getting super gusty so after this step we're gonna stop for a few minutes so the ship can get into a better position Tether cam or Well, if we're going to hold here for a minute, let's do a really good job of imaging um, all the corals on this um, rock. And it'll be good use of time to confirm some IDs and get really good um, images. And we can look around to see if there's any snails or something lurking on the uh, crinoids. Sure. See if we can uh, tickle the Zeus camera with a current oil. Is the uh, turbo camera up anywhere? Is it even being used? Or? I don't. I, I don't think so. This dive. Would be a good rock to get good still images from. The ROV would behave. Oh, uh, holes in there, Daryl. Micro sponge there. Oh, wow. wow. Nice little sponge here. There's like a uh, there's some star in it. Brittle star. Yeah, right. it looks like it's got an ophiocanthid brittle star in there. Um, this is a, hexact a glass sponge or hexactinellid. I'd have to go key it out to get the exact um, family and genus on it. And you can see how much the current is moving the crinoid stalk um, in front of us or in the foreground. And then you get a really nice look of the hold fast on the uh, other right. crinoid there. On the what did the you, sorry, what did you want to see? Oh, I was asking Brian. What oh, you, uh, um, from here, let's look, let's look at the uh, heads of one of the crinoids, if you don't mind. Roger. Oh, and Steve might have called. There is a snail. There look. is a snail. Wow. He's munching. Snail. So this is one of those interesting things that they're 
there has been an association known in the fossil record for from hundreds of millions of years ago. Uh, you'd find crinoids, stalked crinoids, with snails um, just like this. And it wasn't until, I believe, 2017 on board the Okeanos Explorer was the first time it was documented alive. And it was right in, it was in the Line Islands when it was first documented um, in modern times. So this is probably only the fourth or fifth time it's ever been seen um, outside the fossil record. It was something I've been looking at for, looking for, and it was perfect timing that we had to stop here. Because here it is. <laughs> Do we have an ID of the name? Um, and since we're already stopped, I would suggest we sample this. Roger. The snails, the crinate, The whole both? thing. We'll get both. You want to uh, zoom out just a bit, Daryl, nice and slow. We'll get an image of the whole uh, animal before we sample. Ah, uh, looks good. What sample number is this? This will be 033. 33, three. got it. And a warning to all, crinoids make a lot of mucus. Is there a particular reason for that? It's one of the ways um, cessal organisms have to defend themselves, um, is just make a bunch of snot. And it, a lot of corals and things that can't move, one of their defensive mechanisms is um, lots of mucus. It's also one way they probably clean sediment off of themselves. Right. So bamboo corals or isidids are notorious for making a massive amount of mucus when you collect them. You want to uh, push back in there again? Not quite hagfish levels, it, but still lots of the scale there. That's full, is it? Right there. You got sample in situ imagery, yep. right? We're good back here whenever okay. you want to. You can uh, grab zoom out it. just a bit now. That's probably good. Do you care about the base of him, or no? You can just snip it somewhere along the stalk. I would, I would recommend you give yourself a little bit of a buffer between the snail and the stalk. If you want to take it, you know, three, four centimeters down, the stalk would probably be perfect. All right. Something like that, right? Yep, that's perfect. Yeah, 
Yeah. Pilot's choice on where you put it, but I'd suggest one of the bigger ones. All right. Can you uh, zoom out there, video? You want to uh, gently bump that box open for us there? Forward box. Yeah, tool tray. And come out a little bit. Uh, maybe one more. Something, something like that. Oh, watch out for that box. Oh, watch out for that box. If I can <laughs> dare to hope, I would love it if it came up with the sp the, the snail still in position on the crinoid if we can get some really detailed images on in the microscope on deck it would be awesome that box all the way open now is it i somehow think that that is extremely unlikely though if you have a viewer wondering do we know if the snail is eating the crinoid or if it is eating the crinoid poo So the snail is not actually harming the I don't think we know for sure. Okay. Um, it could, it is probably, the, my understanding is it is, the assumption is that it is literally stealing the food out of the crinoid's mouth. Wow. Um, okay, close up. But us. the, we, I, I can, we don't know for sure because we've only seen it three or four times and this might be the only time it's been collected in modern history. Wow. Um, Thank you. All right, and that was sample? 033. All right, sample 033, crinoid and snail associate. Huh? Fine. Uh, we're sh <coughs> at this.